And it's a pleasure to welcome back Dr. Dermalka Simkovich. And I just want to start, I want to wish her um, a, a mazel tov. Someone in Chicago emailed me to say that she just received, received tenure. Um, so I think that's a nice thing. And they said, they're all proud of you in, in Chicago. And I guess at Torah Motion, we're, we're proud also part of the broader mishpacha, the worldwide mishpacha today, Torah, you know, it's not limited to where you have to be. But uh, so, so, so Dr. Malka is the Crown Ryan Chair of Jewish Studies and the director of the Catholic Jewish Programs at Catholic Theological Union in Chicago. As I'm sure many of you have been here before, she's an expert in sort of ancient Judaism, the development of Judaism, the pre-Talmudic period, the pre-Mishnah period, the Second Temple period. And uh, she's a, a prolific author and a wonderful teacher. And it's a pleasure to welcome her back for, I guess we'll call this a three-part mini-series on the development of Torah and early Judaism. So with that, Dr. Malcolm Avakasha, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Rabbi Kalman. It's so wonderful to see all of you. And uh, some of you are familiar faces, some of you are new faces. If you're able to turn on your camera, that would be uh, wonderful. If not, I understand. My plan is to take about 45, 50 minutes. We have an hour, is that right? So to take about 45 minutes going through some sources and, and leave some time for discussion, I do ask that at this time you mute yourselves because sometimes there is inadvertent background noise. So I appreciate um, all of you doing that. Thank you very much. Uh, and also thanks to all the organizers besides Rabbi Kalman, a lot goes into these series, even though they seem so easy. Uh, to organize. Where we're going to start today is uh, by stating a fact that I think we can all agree on, and that is that whatever you call the Torah, and now I'm using it in the broadest sense, the Tanakh, the tradition that was written into these sacred books, and also the oral tradition that the rabbis recognize as Torah, um, that uh, flowed alongside the written scriptures for centuries before it came to the rabbis, we can all agree that this giant collection of Torah, of wisdom, of teaching is aware of itself. And what I mean by that is that as Torah is produced in the written form, in oral form, this Torah engages with the Torah that comes previously. And right now I'm not talking about biblical authorship. I'm not talking about who wrote the Pentateuch. I'm just talking about an obvious phenomenon you can find in many of the Torah, uh, in motion Torah series, uh, and that is intertextuality, right? When I say intertextuality, I mean that a later text will engage and play with and experiment with an earlier text. What does it mean though, to have a scriptural set of texts? And I've, I've talked about this a little bit in my book, Discovering Second Temple Literature. When we're talking about the Second Temple period, it's a little bit too early to talk about a closed canon. Of course, you have the Torah, the Torah, the first five books, the scriptural, sacred, authoritative, you can say, you can say fixed. I'm not gonna get into the academic debates about that. The Nevim, likewise, fixed. The Ketuvim was open-ended, and we know this from the Mishnah because the rabbis debate whether we should put in Shira Shireen, should we put in Kohelet, right? So when I talk about the Torah, I'm talking about in the broadest sense, a scriptural tradition that engages with itself, that um, interprets itself. And I, I think I've said this in past classes, um, that is doing, um, that, is, uh, that is darshaning itself, to use a non-word, uh, before there's even a concept of pshat. So Midrash actually precedes pshat, by which I mean that Jews in the second temple period are actively and playfully and boldly interpreting earlier scriptural traditions before they're trying to, to discern exactly what every tag tag, every single letter um, and dot means in the text. Uh, and the reason why um, the, the Judeans become convinced that God has written every word of the Torah so early on, this is a central concept among Jews in the second temple period that the Torah now, uh, let's say, by that I mean the Pentateuch, the first five books, is divine, is not only because of what it says at the end of Devarim, but because in these books and in all of the Tanakh, what becomes the closed canon of the Tanakh, writing is a divine act. It's a sacred act. It's a specialized skill. It's a prized skill. And in the Torah, writing is an act of divine authority. And I think that very often what we know about the rabbis can trip us up. Because we know that in the rabbinic period, oral transmission is so important. And sometimes you might hear a teacher say, well, in Judaism, oral tradition is more important than the written tradition. That is a little bit of a muddled statement. 
because very early on the act of writing is a divine act of authority that is limited to God and to a few of God's messengers, specifically the king who writes God's words as an act of humility and the prophet who writes God's words in order to convey them to the people. And so you have a very limited subset of individuals who are writing the divine uh, message in order to convey them to the masses. But what is confusing in fact, is that the purpose of this writing is to communicate God's message orally. And so you have God writing in the Tanakh, you have the king and the prophet, maybe the scribe later on writing uh, God's word. But within this framework of writing, there is at the very earliest stages, a modality of oral communication. And that's where things get a little sticky. This binary between the oral transmission and the written transmission is really not a binary at all, because even in the written tradition, you have this element of oral communication with the people. And what we're going to do uh, today is look at some of these sources that present writing Torah as a divine act. Look at some sources that explore how for the king writing Torah is an act of humility <coughs> that subjugates the king to divine will. And then we'll see, and again, I'm gonna ask some of you to mute. I see that some of you are not muted, so I would appreciate that, thank you. Um, and then we'll see that there is a shift in the second temple period. And the second temple period, we see that writing becomes a more uh, democratized practice. So whereas in earlier sources, writing is a divine act um, and uh, it's, it's really done in the context of producing some authoritative, some design, by the second temple period and ultimately by the late second temple period, writing becomes something else. It becomes a mode of remembering, of interpreting. Um, and this, I think, provides us with the seeds of what later will become, how the rabbis conceived it, in oral tradition that engages with the written tradition as two separate entities. So again, in the earliest stages, there isn't this binary. They're interacting with each other. You write a text, right, a prophet, a king, in order to convey God's word orally, to read publicly to the people, to unify them, to bring them together with a common message, a common memory. But ultimately these tracks become separate. And that happens as Jews begin to actively interpret the scriptures and then sort of take on the, the agency to produce and write their own texts, not just the messages that God delivers to the prophet to record. Okay, so that was a lot. I just said a lot of things. And so um, I, if you've taken any of my classes, you know that I don't like to share my screen. I'm very selfish with my eyes. I like to see who I'm teaching. And then once I share the, oh, thank you very much. Once I share the screen, then I can't really see you. So I try to limit how much I, I share the screen. But you also might remember that I tinker and tinker over and over with my source sheets. And so last night I was rearranging and adding. And so uh, this is not very nice for Rabbi Kelman, but of the source sheet that I'm working with is a different, it's not radically different, but it's a little different. And so um, as usual, I have to, just to be fair to you, um, give you my email address. If you want the updated one that I'm sharing with you today, you can email me. I'm Simkovich at CTU at EDU. It's very, very close to what's online. And I'll also say that I'm having mouse trouble. So it's, I'm going to be slower because my mouse is not responding to me very well. So it might take me a minute or two when I'm trying to scroll or share a, a document. All right. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three kinds of sources. Uh, we're going to start with uh, passages in the Tanakh that refer to divine sacred writings as writings produced directly by God. All right. And again, there are special individuals who are authorized to reproduce these writings, but primarily as an act of humility or as an act of conveying this message to a broad audience orally. So we're gonna look at texts that speak of God as the ultimate author, the ultimate poet, you might say. And then we'll look at some texts where things go terribly wrong and the king does not, as is prescribed in Devarim, properly record, and study the Torah as he's supposed to, and then thing, and then what happens, what fallout takes place when things go wrong. And then we'll look at the beginning stages of a transition where writing becomes not an act of imitation, but of experimentation and interpretation. And we're going to focus there, I hope, 
on Nehemia Perachet, which I've talked a little bit about in, in previous classes, but I haven't really spent a lot of time with. And I never know how these things are going to go time-wise. There's never enough time to do everything in depth. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of sources here and we'll pick and select a few to really focus on. Um, okay, so we're going to begin, I guess now hesitatingly, I have to share my screen. So let's see if my mouse is gonna respond, hopefully it will. Okay, so what I want you to tell me is whether when I share my screen, you're seeing my notes because I can't really tell when it's when I'm pressing share here. Let's see, hopefully this is the, is that, yeah, that should be the source sheet. You see writing as a divine act, okay, perfect. All right, fantastic. Okay, so um, I want to point out a few sources to you that really represent one of the most powerful anthropomorphic images in Tanakh, by which I mean in these, in these texts, God engages with the world physically through the written scriptures, and thus the written text becomes an extension of God. Again, the written text, and here the Luchot, becomes a physical manifestation of God and the primary medium through which God engages with the people. So when you scoff, I don't, you probably don't scoff, but when others scoff at this notion of divine authorship when it comes to the Torah, well, it's important that anyone who does scoff or is suspicious just knows that this notion is deeply embedded in the Torah itself which presents God as writing, not only dictating to Moshe the Torah, but also writing down the Luchot. And over and over, this is underscored in both the first set of Luchot, the tablets that are presented to Moshe, and also the second. And there's this very enigmatic image of the finger of God having produced these Luchot, whatever that means, who can say, but this image is, you know, it's, it, it's mysterious, it's strange, it's unique. And yet we have it over and over, unique in the sense that we don't have a parallel image, but it does show up repeatedly. And when God makes the second set of Luchot after the incident of the golden calf, you see again, you know, uh, there are certain circumstances that are different with this second set of Luchot, but God does specify that, hold on one second, that uh, he, like the first set, has produced these Luchot. So in Shmot Lamedalev, the Kathavti Ala Luchot at Advarim, Asher Hayu Ala Luchot Arushamim, that I'm going to write exactly what was written on the first set, Asher Shibarta. And I like the tone over there. It is a little accusatory. You know, there's this big debate um, in the medieval sources over whether Moshe drops the Luchot um, because he's in shock at what he sees as he goes, as he descends the mountain or he throws them intentionally. But I think God is pretty clear when he's talking to Moshe about the second set. She Barta is not a very, um, not a very ambiguous uh, verb. And uh, you know, God's like, remember when you did this terrible thing, you destroyed not just the Luchot, but this, this representation of the divine manifestation in the world. Yeah, remember when you did that? All right, I guess I have to fix things, God says. But over and over the, the, the notion of the written word has this sort of infinite quality because when you are being told when something is written and you're required to replicate it there's this sense of ongoing infinite transmission sorry again i'm going to ask people to mute if there is something that you don't understand i'd be very glad um to, to for you to cut in but 95 percent of the time questions can wait until Q&A. Again, if there's a clarity issue, if, um, if I need to translate something, please feel free uh, to jump in. Okay, so we have this notion that God uh, wrote the Luchot again in Devarim. Um, Moshe recalls at the end of the 40 year um, period in the desert uh, on the cusp of his death, he talks about the Luchot being written with the finger of God. Why is this detail so very central to this memory of the Luchot being given to the people? Um, and the answer, of course, is that it imbues these teachings with authority. And then as the prophets, the kings, the scribes are transmitting and copying and circulating these, not just the texts, but the what's written on the text orally, there's a clear derivation that they come from the divine essence. And so all of this becomes very, very important when, um, when we establish a monarchy in the land of Israel. Because as we know, kings, at least you know, in the ancient Near East, did claim uh, uh, 
to be all powerful. We have many written um, inscriptions produced by kings in the ancient Near East, recalling their victories, depicting themselves as gods, the most powerful um, humans on the planet, this sort of hyperbolic language. And so the king of uh, the Israelites, as they enter the land of Israel, is um, has to be absolutely and unequivocally aware that he cannot claim such kind of divine universal power. In fact, we know this very famous uh, passage from Devarim Yud Zion that um, the king's power has to be checked in terms of the women the, uh, that he marries, the financial um, uh, accumulation uh, that he accrues, the horses, all of the things that would have uh, inflated the ego of the king and given him this idea that he is the most powerful um, human. No, this is unacceptable because we require the checks and balances and the primary check and balance of the uh, Israelite king is the, the written Torah. Uh, the king, of course, is required to write his own Torah. And this is an act of forced humility, right? Because as he writes the Torah and he learns that what is written in the Torah is that God, not himself, is the most important mover of humanity. Uh, this is going to be uh, a reminder that the king, of course, cannot act of his own accord, but his primary job is to bring the people, to shepherd the people towards a life of worship and obedience. And so the process of human writing, as it's recorded in the Torah, is one that is an act of obeisance, of humility to God. And I just, I included this little story from Shemot Yad Zion. We don't have to discuss it too much, but um, but here uh, we do also have the seeds of uh, writing things down to remember. There are some cases where you have to write things down to remember God's un universal power. And so we do have this, um, the, the beginnings of this notion after Amalek attacks and God tells Moshe, write down, Azikar and Basefer, write down um, this incident. Uh, but generally writing and especially writing the Torah is an act of humility of sort of containment of power uh, and, and it's limiting. So what happens when things go bad? There are two stories that we have. Um, well, we have more than two, but two that I wanna focus on that take place at the very end of the first temple period. And in these stories, we see that the Torah is not being written by the king and therefore the people are not hearing the Torah because the point is that the Torah that the Torah is not only produced by the king but then is a unifier of the community as the king reads the Torah aloud orally. Again, we have this mishmash of oral versus written. It's all in one image. But when the king is not producing the Torah, then the people are not getting it. Um, and so we have a very famous story uh, known as Yoshiahu's reform. Yoshiahu, of course, is a Judean king in the 7th century BCE. Now things are looking a little rough in the 7th century BCE. Yoshiahu is a great king, but Babylonia is looming in the background, becoming a more and more powerful entity. Uh, the people are not doing very well at this time. Now, of course, by this time, there is no Northern Israelite king. They were exiled by the Assyrians in 722. Uh, so we have Judea just hanging on by a thread over here, and Yoshiah who knows the words of the prophets and the predictions that if the people return to God, they will be protect protected from their enemies. And so he instructs his officers to clean out the temple, To uh, it's going to become a reform. Um, uh, it's going to become this massive communal teshuva. Unfortunately, it doesn't stick. But what happens when he says clean out the temple to his officers? Well, the high priest Kilkiyahu finds a safer Torah. And this is, um, this is a disastrous, <laughs> this is a disastrous incident because it implies that the Torah, um, well, let's just take a look at some of the, I, I think it's okay for me to look at the Hebrew, right? But uh, if you do want to access this text in English while I'm looking at the Hebrew, you can go onto the website and just take a look at it. I'm going to look at the Hebrew for now. So uh, in a very dramatic fashion, Chilkiyahu, the high priest, um, says to Shaphan, the scribe, I found a safer Torah. Why does he go to Shaphan, the scribe? Because the scribe should know what is in the temple. And you know the fact that no one had accounted for the safer Torah, and we're going to see that there doesn't seem to have been awareness of this text, that's a failure on the part of the administration of Yoshiahu. Um, and so he Chilkiyahu gives the scroll, safer is not a book, right? It's a scroll to Shaphan, and Shaphan reads it. 
and he realizes, okay, we have a problem. Now Yoshiahu tell, uh, sorry, Shaphan goes to the king and tells him what happens and reads the words of the Torah in front of the king. Now we don't know exactly what he's reading. There are um, suggestions that this could have been Devarim. There are curses at the end of Devarim. Maybe it could be Vayikra. We really don't know what is the Sefer HaTorah, but whatever it is, um, has to do with God's punishment of the people should they stray from his ways. And Yoshao hears the words of the Torah and immediately realizes that they're in big trouble. And he goes into mourning. He rips his clothes and he institutes this massive teshuvah. Uh, but before he does that, um, they go to uh, a prophet, a prophetess. They go to Hulda, the prophetess, and they say, all right, Hulda, we need your help. Here's our situation. Are we in trouble? We found the Sefer Torah. It says all these things that suggest that we uh, have much repentance to do. We have not been following the ways of God. We have not been observing the laws as they're recorded in the Torah. And she says, yes, congratulations. You've read this correctly. You are in big trouble. Everything that is in this holy uh, scroll, the sacred text, I will make sure uh, takes place. So because you did not protect, preserve, circulate, teach the contents of this text, now you are subject to its curses. And this really is the theme. It's not just that the people have sinned, they've gone astray, but that they haven't preserved this written or this physical manifestation of the divine presence. The scroll is not just a scroll. It's not just you know an, an item. It's the manifestation of the divine intent. And when you aren't protecting the scroll and copying it and reading it, then you have severed that connection with God. And so while you might think that the temple is at the center, at the heart of the story, right? They're cleaning up the temple. This is, after all, the first temple period, right? We're way before the time of the rabbis who are credited with replacing the temple with the scroll or however you might want to say it. But look at this early stage. We are reading a story about how the, the Beit HaMikdash is being cleaned down and restored. But at the heart of it, at this very early stage, is this tradition of the sanctity and centrality of the written text, the written Torah. Again, what is Torah? We're not told, but there's the self-awareness within the scriptural story that the Torah um, is, is um, it needs the protection of the people. Now, something very similar happens just one generation later. And this takes place at the cusp of the Babylonian exile. So you're talking at uh, the very end of the second century, early uh, sixth century BCE, and Yehoiakim, the son of Yoshiahu, is not the same Sadiq that his father was. And instead of Shaphan being the scribe, you have, uh, well, Shaphan's around, but you also have his son, uh, Gimariahu, and his grandson, Michaihu. So it's the same family of scribes, but it's the son and the grandson. So we're a generation or two later from Yoshiahu's reform. And the reform, like I said, did, uh -oh, I'm sorry, did not stick. Um, and so we have a situation, but this is a very uh, intriguing and upsetting story that is actually less known, I think, than the story of Yoshiahu's reform because it's buried in Yirmiyahu. A lot of people sort of are not reading Yirmiyahu from cover to cover, even though they should. Um, and so in this text, Hashem, God tells Yirmiyahu to take, um, take a Migilat Sefer a, a, a scroll and write all of God's words on it and present it to the people. Now, where's this going to be done? It's going to be done in, in, uh, on the Temple Mount in Beit Hashem. Um, now, Yirmiyahu is on the outs with the monarchy, and he knows that if he shows up there, he will be in danger for his life. So he sends Baruch Beneria, his own scribe. So already there's a little bit of a red flag here. Yirmiyahu has his scribe. The king has his scribes. Shouldn't they all be sort of talking to each other, not on opposing ends of this political um, conflict? So Yirmiyahu has his like little personal attendant. Not, that, that's very disrespectful. Baruch is not a little personal attendant. He is a great giant and a you know, scholar. But why is it that you have Baruch and Yirmiyahu sort of on the outs uh, from the political insiders and then you have the king, Yehoiakim, and you have Gemariahu and Michaihu, right? Already there's something a little bit uh, not okay about the situation. Yirmiyahu says to Baruch, go to the house of God. I can't go. You have to go and read the, this Migila, which contains the, the um, critiques 
uh, the condemnations of God telling the people that they are about to be exiled. And so Baruch does so. And the attendants of the king hear Baruch reciting these words of condemnation um, in this Sefer. Is it the Torah? Doesn't seem to be, but it is the word of God as told from God to Yirmiyahu to Baruch to the people. So again, maybe not a Torah, the way that Yoshiao finds a Torah that had been long lost for centuries in the temple, but nevertheless, it's the, it's the words of God. And it could be other parts of Yirmiyahu that were ultimately canonized in the Tanakh. So these could be words that are today biblical, but we don't know exactly what Baruch said. We just know that he uh, recited the words that God dictated to Yirmiyahu and that the people were very, very alarmed. The officials said, who wrote this down? They asked Baruch, did you write this down? And, and Baruch says, no. Uh, this was Yermia who, who wrote down and, and who, sorry, this is Yermia who dictated it to me and I wrote it down. Sorry, my mouse is not responding. So I'm trying to like get to the right place. But in any case, when, um, when Baruch says in verse 18, which is not highlighted in Midchet, um, that Yermia who told me what to write down, they say, you need to hide. You need, you need to get out of here because you're going to, going to be killed. But what ends up happening is that they confiscate the Megillah. They bring it to the King Yehoyakim. And if this was a small class of 15 people, I'll just ask somebody to call it out, but I think we're a little more than that. And what happens when Yehoiakim hears the words of the Megillah being read to him? He tears it up column by column. And so he's hearing it and he destroys it. There's no more violent act that you could do, Kivyachol or Lahavdil, against God than take the physical manifestation of the divine word and destroy it. This is considered to be truly an act of violence. And so, okay, let me find that over here. Um, so Yehoiakim uh, rips it up, he burns it. And then, okay, so that's in uh, Pesach Chav Gimel. And they have no fear, right? Lo karu et bidehem. Why is that important? Because you might remember that just a generation ago, Yoshiahu did, was smart enough at least to know to rip his clothes because the predictions that were read to him were so terrifying that he knew they were in trouble. Well, this fearless goon Yehoiakim, his son, does not fear. He says, you know what? No, I don't need a Torah to keep me in check. I am in control of the situation. I answer to no one, right? He doesn't have that humility that is demanded of the king in Devarim. And so he, uh, you know, he is ready to kill Yermiahu and Baruch, should he find them, they're hiding. They end up in Egypt. Um, but uh, what does God say to Yermiahu when this takes place? He says, okay, Yehoiakim destroyed that Megillah, right? Look at Chavchet. Shuv kach lecha Megillah acheret. Take another one. We're going to do this all over again, right? The first one, I share Sarak Yehoiakim. The first one has been burned. And so now you're going to produce the second one. This is very evocative of the Luchot that are destroyed. Of course, there it's Asher Shibarta to Moshe. You destroyed the Luchot. So we're going to produce another one. The implication here, even though we think of the written text as sort of as, as permanent and therefore destructible, when it comes to the message of God, you cannot run, right? It's like it's like a ninve. It's it's like the story of Yonah. You cannot run from the written message of God, even though it's a physical thing. You might be next to it. You might be far from it. You might know it's there. You might not know it's there. It has a potency that is transcendent that goes beyond the physical aspect of the written work. But the fact that it is written is um, imbues it with with authority at the same time. So this is evocative, I think, of the, um, uh oh, do you see male quit unexpectedly? <laughs> okay, all right. So we have just one generation later, the king hearing the words of God written down as they're written down and destroys them. Again, very, very violent act. And we know the end of the story that just a few years later, Babylonia comes in and destroys uh, the, the temple, exiles the people, and that's considered, you know, the greatest catastrophe in the biblical, um, in, in, in the entire Tanakh. I want to move on, uh, but you get the point here that when the king does not subjugate himself to the Torah by writing it and repeating it over, um, bad things happen. I, I think I'm going to, um, well, hmm, um, should I do a little bit of Yechezka? I think this is very interesting. Um, so Yechezka, hold on, I my, oh my gosh, I'm really sorry about my mouse. I have to figure out how to fix this by next week. Hold on a second. Um, so Yechezkel uh, um, <laughs> describes a very interesting 
image in which God gives him a scroll and he has to eat it. Again, a very famous image. Lots of us have heard of this. There's actually a word in Greek for this. And the word is hierophagy. And again, oh my gosh, let me see if I can get my mouse to go to chat so I can write this down. Hold on. And I'm not reading questions. I'm not reading comments yet. Feel free to put things in. Uh, and then we'll use it for a conversation. Uh, the difference is that Moshe has to shut the tabs of the mountain. Yep. So we will um, write down the mountain, maybe. Uh, so we'll talk about that at Q&A. Okay, so this is the word, hierophagy. So, so eating uh, a sacred text. What is the point of this? Why does Yechezkel have to, now, of course, I can't like press X because my mouse won't go there. We have problems. I think it's a battery issue. Um, so what is the significance of Yechezkel eating this? Well, there seems to be, at least um, according to the interpreters, this notion that when you eat something, especially in this vision, you are internally transformed by it. So the fact that God presumably makes this, oh my gosh, I'm a little bit stressed out right now because my, hold on, I can't get to my source sheet. When God get, makes the scroll and gives it to Yechezkel, and he says, eat the scroll, go speak to the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth and he gave me the scroll to, to eat. This is an internal transformation that um, Yechezkel undergoes. The writings of God has that power uh, because it's the closest you get to this physical manifestation in a way that the um, Beit HaMikdash does not. So um, I just wanted to mention that I'm not going to do Malachi, but here you do have uh, the prophet describing how God writes everything down. And this might be familiar language to you. So if you look, um, uh, we'll do um, we'll do uh, pasuk uh, tet zayin uh, az nidbru is a very famous verse. Yer ei adonai isha reehu vayeksheva adonai vayishama vekatev sefer zikaron lefanav yer ei adonai. What does God do? God has a book of remembrances where he he takes notes and he listens, and every single uh, remembrance is in this book. So God, the author, God, the poet. Um, such a powerful image that it actually runs through the prophetic imagination. But at some point in the second temple period, we see a transition from writing as an authoritative text, writing authoritative texts that derive from the divine will, right? Who writes a scriptural text? It's God, or it's the prophet representing God, or it's the king subjugating himself to God. But we see a transition in the second temple period where writing becomes a way not just to imitate and to be subjugated, but to remember and interpret. And so most famously, we have the end of Megillat Esther, which is a little hard to understand because there are multiple instances of writings in Perek Tet. Um, but First, Mordechai writes down the story, and again, we're reading this as scripture, right? We're reading Esther as a story that is scriptural. So we think of this as sort of sanctioned by God, right? But internally in the story, they're doing something new. They're not um, mimicking the word of God as it's dictated to them, right? Like with the king or with Yirmiyahu but they're creating something. And then ultimately that takes on the authority that we consider to be divinely sanctioned, but it's something else, right? So Mordechai creates, he produces, he's not imitating. And he writes the Sefer, he writes an account of the story that we know as Miguel and Esther, and it's sent out. And then later Esther and Mordechai produce another a document, right? But Tichtov Esther HaMalka, but Avichayel, so it's not totally clear what this is, but she's authorizing, right, with the royal, um, the royal seal, maybe, but she's she's like authorizing this, um, the establishment of this holiday and of the previous text that Mordechai had sent out, etc. So writing becomes something that really imbues humanity with creative agency. And it's no longer something that is just there to sort of uh, remind them who's in charge. Now I'm it's going a little fast because I really, really want to concentrate on Nehemiah. I mean, this is this is where it's at. This is what I want to. I'm just going down to make sure that okay, it's just Daniel. I, I switched the order a little bit last night, so we're not really going to focus on Daniel. Although I do want to go back to that source next week 
Okay, this is what I wanna do for the next 10 minutes or so. Um, and so what I'm going to, let's see, I'm worried if I stop my share, then my, my mouse might not be good to me. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna pull up the source sheet in my second computer. It's very clever, I've never thought of this before. Um, and then I'm gonna stop sharing, that way I can talk to you and see all of you. Okay, so in Nehemiah, very hard to date. I'm not going to give you an exact date for Nehemiah, but the scene is post-exilic. We've completed the building of the walls of Jerusalem, but we have not yet embarked on, or we have not yet completed, hi everybody, the, uh, the construction of the second temple, right? So this is anywhere, and again, I'm not talking about the academic attitude towards when Nehemiah lived. Many academics put him in the fifth or fourth century, but um, as this text is retold, we're anywhere between 538 and 515 BC. So 538 is when the exile comes to an end, right? Cyrus has defeated the Babylon Empire and allows the Judeans in exile to return. And around 515, remember numbers go down, we're moving towards zero. And around 515 is when the second temple is constructed. So we're somewhere in this, oh, it's gonna use a Christian word, purgatory. I shouldn't, I shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? Some, in between, we're not in the second temple period, we're not in the exilic period, we're in this transitional stage. And we have this very dramatic account of Ezra and Nehemiah gathering the people and reading um, and, and reading the Torah to them. And the people are crying and they're devastated. Um, and why are they devastated? Well, think about how Yoshiahu responded when they found the Torah. Think about how Yehoiakim was supposed to respond when they found the Torah um, and didn't. The fact that the Jews are hearing words and seeing a text or Judeans that is unfamiliar to them is enough to establish the reality that something has gone wrong because the transmission has been cut off, right? This is a text that they should know and they should know it because they should have access to it orally from a king, a scribe or a prophet who has preserved the written text and then gathered them in a public in a public space and read it to them as is described in Devari. So in order to understand why the people respond so powerfully to this text, you have to understand this pattern of failures and successes when it comes to doing this, to producing the text and reading it to the people. And uh, all right, let's take a look inside because where we land with this scene is, uh, is someplace very new. And that is that for the first time ever, the Judeans actively, actively interpret their scriptures. This is something that we've never seen before. So this is the first instance, I would say, of Midrash that you have, and it's encased, it's embedded in the Tanakh. So we're going to end in a place where the Judeans are reading their text and then interpreting it to create something new. Okay, all right, so, Oh no, I just, um, all right, I'm, I'm, again, I'm not gonna share. Uh, so I'm just gonna, you're gonna see me sideways over here. We are 94 people, so I'm not sure if I should open this up to somebody who wants to read, but you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, oh no, shaking the head. Okay, no, Donnie Freeman says, don't do that. So I'm not going to do it. Okay, I'm gonna read to you. All right, is it okay? Can you nod if you're okay with Hebrew? I don't mind doing English. It's a little more powerful in the Hebrew. So you can follow along in the English. We're in Nehemiah 8, Nehemiah Perichet, at the very beginning. I'm going to read some Hebrew. You can follow along whatever language is best for you. But yeah, the whole nation gathers like one person. That's good, right? We're starting off very well because the function of these gatherings is to unite the people in common worship um, of God. And they're at this place by the Sha'ar Amayim, the gate of water, the water gate, not water gate, the gate of water. And uh, they say to Ezra Hasofer, Ezra the scribe. Now remember, we have this as a formal official position. We know it from the first temple period. Remember Shaphan, Gemar Yahu, Michaihu, Baruch. To be a scribe is no, you're no chopped liver. It's a very, very important position because you are, if you do it right, supposed to make sure that the prophet or king that you attend to is properly recording the word of God and most importantly, disseminating it orally to the people. So Ezra the Sofer brings Sefer Torah at Moshe, whatever that is, again, we don't know, but brings a scroll known as the Torah of Moshe, the teaching of Moshe to the people. Oh, but this is very strange. Look at Pesuk Bev by Avi Ezra HaKohen. Wait a second. Now I do want you to call out, just some of yourselves. What was he called in, in the earlier verse? What was he called? Ezra the... Uh -oh. Ezra Sofer. Thank you very much. 
Ezra has so far. Wait a second. Now he's a Kohen. Now he's a priest. I'm not, I mean, I might not be a super close reader of the text, but I'm, I can read from one verse to another. Is he a scribe or is he a Kohen? So put that question on the back burner. I mean, the, we can assume that the writer of this text is not just, you know, being sloppy. Okay. Ezra Kohen at Torah. The, Ezra, the priest brings the teaching, the scroll, whatever it is, before the community. And we have very nice egalitarian image over here. Me'ish adisha, from man to woman. Anyone who could understand. Anyone, even the little ones. Anyone who could understand was there. Uh, and he reads this at the <coughs> Watergate all day. Mina or from the from dawn until um, noon or until chatzot, right? And he's reading to everyone who's um, who can understand. And you can imagine like that a, a pin would drop. Look at the end of verse three. Like there's utter silence. That was kol ha'am. The ears of every member of the nation is listening attentively to what he's saying to the Sefer Torah, to the scroll of the Torah. And again, imagine just total silence, just complete intensity. And everyone is sort of united in this eagerness, this desperation, but of course they're not gonna like what they hear. But Amod Ezra has so fair. Ah, now we're back to being a scribe. Okay, strange. So Ezra is standing there, the scribe on this little uh, platform, this Migdal Eitz Asher Devar. They made it just for the occasion. They create this little, so box, right? Like in Hyde Park, you know, you stand on a little stool and you, you're a little taller than everybody else. Um, and, and he has people next to him, people who are, they're all Judean. Some have Aramaic, uh, some have uh, Persian names, some have uh, Hebrew names, uh, <clears throat> which speaks to the degree of, of integration, of assimilation that has taken place over so short a time. All right, <clears throat> sorry, I'm losing my voice. I'm getting excited. Vayitach Ezra. Um, so now he doesn't have a title. Now he's just our buddy Ezra. And he opens up the book before everybody and he begins to read. Everybody stands up and he gives the people a blessing. By Ref Ezra, I mean, he, he doesn't give the people a blessing. He blesses God before the people. And um, and they all say, Amen, the Amen. I'm in verse six. I'm in Pasuk Vav. And uh, there's just this very dramatic moment. I've said before when I've taught, you know that something is dramatic in Tanakh when the action slows down and you go into descriptive literature, right? You're slowing down the action, you're building up the tension, you're building up the climax. All right, and so all these people are there and the Levi'im are there, Mivinim et ha'am, teaching the people its meaning. So what does that, this is already a red flag, right? And at the end of verse seven, what does it mean that the Levites are explaining Mivinim et ha'am, the Torah? What are they doing? Well, we have a problem here, literally a problem in translation. If the Torah is in Hebrew and the people have been in exile and they're speaking Aramaic, they literally do not understand what Ezra is telling them. And so you have the Levites, the scholars who are telling them exactly what this text means. Now, this is already, okay, you know something's not good if the people do not have access to the original text. And the Yikra'u Basefer, I'm in verse eight. They continue on and on. They're reading Basefer Batorah Talahim before Rash. They're reading exactly what is written in, uh, it should, it's more like hearing, they're hearing Ezra recite what's in Sefer Torah Elohim. Okay. And the Levites, or I think it's Vayikru HaLevi'in, the Levites are reciting and explaining the meaning of the Torah. <clears throat> okay. By Avinu Bamikra and their understanding maybe in translation. Okay. So now the people are learning the sense of the text from the Levites, not from Ezra directly. And the Levites are saying, calm down, relax with the verse nine. Altit Ablu, stop mourning. Altit Khu, don't cry. They're crying and crying, crying. Why are they crying? Again, hearken back to those stories with Yirmiyahu, right? With Yoshia, with the other kings um, that were portents of the disastrous Babylonian exile. The people have heard something again that has to do with impending punishment should they lose the transmission of the divine word when that continuity is broken things go bad they're crying now maybe they're crying because they now know why they've suffered for so many years maybe they're crying tears of joy that they've been restored in the land but maybe they're probably both right they're crying because now they've been given a second chance they've been restored to judea and yet maybe they haven't fully returned maybe they're aware that they have not engaged in a full teshuva and they know that they can lose everything once again so it's some combination of relief of despair of fear of um of, of happiness and the Levites say you know what just go and celebrate and by the way it happens to be tishrei and that's going to be very important remember what the date is at the beginning of um 
at the beginning of the of this uh, chapter, it's the first day of the seventh, seventh month, which will become Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is not really a biblical holiday, so they're not celebrating Rosh Hashanah here, but they are, and this is where it gets to interpretation, and then we'll end there. They are going to celebrate Sukkot. So look at what happens. Okay. The Levim um, are telling them, relax, don't, maybe not relax, but, uh, but, but don't mourn, don't cry, go celebrate. Look at Pasuk Yudva, Yom Lehem Lechu, Eat yummy, delight, you know, treats. And send, you know, make sure everyone who doesn't have enough, make sure that everyone has enough, right? Celebrate um, together. Okay. But the, the people keep crying. How do I know that? Look at verse 11. Shut up. <laughs> Again, I'm not, I'm a little irreverent, but the fact that they keep saying quiet, 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 it means that the people are just bawling because they're so overwhelmed with emotion at the contents of the Torah that they have just heard. But finally, they get a hold of themselves and they go to celebrate. Now they had read, we actually know what they had read. Because if you look at Pasuk Yadalad, this is what they had found. They had read that they had read that the Israelites were supposed to celebrate in the seventh month, Chag HaSukot. And that's coming up, right? It's the first day of the seventh month. And this means that they were probably looking at Vayikra uh, Gimel in the 40s, by uh, Leviticus 23, maybe 41, 42, 43, where it says, celebrate in huts for seven days and take the following indigenous fruits. Celebrate with those fruits. There's a juxtaposition here. If you look at uh, Vayikra Mem Chav uh, Gimel, it's not clear what the relationship is between you take the fruits and you celebrate. So what do you think? the Judeans in this story do. They make a hermeneutical interpretation based on juxtaposition, right? This is one of the rules of interpretation that become core to the rabbinic, uh, the, the rules of methodology, right? And they make a rule, they make an interpretation based on juxtaposition, what do they do? Okay. So look at, um, okay, 14, all right, Asher Yishvu Bnei Yisrael, this is what they read. They announced in all the places where they were dwelling that you have to take Ale Zayit, Ale Echem, and take all these indigenous fruits that are mentioned by Ikra Chav Gimel. And now look at the last three words of this verse. Now somebody has to, this is so exciting, somebody has to unmute and just read the last three words, Hebrew or English, of verse 15. Or else I will. Okay, what do they do with these indigenous La fruits? Sot suka right. Sukkot. Exactly. Exactly. La no. asot sukot ka katu. Now, of course, you could maybe suggest that they had a different version of Vayikra that said, you know, use these indigenous fruits and build sukkot, but I don't think that's what's happening at all. They're reading this text. And they have to figure out what it means in the most practical sense. And so they take the indigenous fruits and they use these fruits to build their huts. This could be, and this is not my own um, idea. I, I uh, learned this from my professor, uh, Dr. Mark Brettler at Brandeis. Uh, this could be the earliest instance of what we would call midrash, that Jews are engaging with their texts and then actively interpreting them. And then what's so delightful is that this interpretation ends up becoming authoritative scripture as well, right? It's in Nehemiah. Now, what I want to leave you with before we go to a uh, conversation is this idea that contrary to the notion that writing is sort of permanent and immobile, what would change if we thought of writing as an act of perpetuation, right? An act that produces a sort of infinite continuum because the writing is there in order to communicate orally to the people. And that teaching is supposed to go on and on and on and on in an unbroken chain. And so every generation has to write the same text over and over and over and over and over, right? That's a continuum that creates a chain of transmission. Now, what happens in the second temple period is that that becomes overlaid with a new, trend, a new tradition, and that's the tradition of interpretation. Next week, we're going to talk about translation.
but I want to make sure since there are 92 people on this call that if there are any questions or thoughts uh, or insights um, that they are shared. So now sort of my mouse is working. So I'm going to look at some of these comments, but I'm also going to invite, um, invite you to, uh, I think Rabbi Kalman, should we uh, have people raise their hands or do you think people can just jump in? Uh, people can just, you know, jump in. You can see the questions in the, in the chat box. If yeah, you want to take can. those, you know, first, and then, as you do that, if any, they can raise their hand. That's always nice. So they can just unmute themselves. I think that's right, some of these are just better. okay. All right. So let's see yeah. how it goes. So some yeah. so some of these comments are are insights. Um, is there any relevance that a small portion of the Babylonian? Yeah. Okay. So the question is from Saul's iPad. Is there any relevance that a small portion of the Babylonian population returned to Israel? Right. So the number that we think is forty three thousand. So very very small percentage of Judeans in Persia actually returned to the land of Israel. And of course, it's a major failure. Uh, but it also gives way to a global Jewish presence because there are Jews who stay in what is now Persia or they leave, but they don't go to the land of Israel. Uh, they go all around the Levant, right, all along the Mediterranean. And so um, for those communities, the text becomes central, right? They don't have immediate access to the temple. So it's hugely relevant in terms of the centrality of the text. But what I think is more interesting is that the text is central even when the people are all in one place, right? Even when there's a temple, even when there's a first temple. And so, cause we often think like temple, exile, temple, text, right? Like the text shows up when we don't have the temple. Uh, but we have stories in the Tanakh about how important the written word is even when there is a Beit HaMikdash. Um, so somebody private messaged me and said, she's not clear as to how they could have stopped keeping Sukkot. I mean, look, this was, it, it's presented as a tradition that had been lost, right? Maybe they could not observe it. In exile. Maybe some were observing it, but not in the way that they were supposed to. We simply don't know. But I, I can't tell you how they were observing Sukkot at all. What I can tell you is that according to this story, there was not a successful continuous chain of transmission of the Torah. Now, Ezra had the Torah. Oh, I forgot to tell you why he's so fair and why he's Kohen. I forget to that. Uh, he had the Torah, right? So it doesn't mean that like no one had the Torah, but it wasn't being communicated to the people because when they hear those words in Vayikra, they cry. Um, so fair Kohen, we're in a transitional period, right? Where the fact that Ezra has this dual identity is pivotal to his success. He has both a position of leader as a priest who can administrate in the temple and whose ancestors did the same. But an equally, perhaps an equally significant role in his position as preserver and conservator and transmitter of the text. Right? And that's really the message of the story is that both of these things have to exist in an interconnected way. Even during the time of the first temple period, the king has to be recording and disseminating the words of the Torah. It's key to successfully administrate in the temple. Okay, um, other questions? I, yes, I see some interesting insights. I don't really see questions in the chat. And if anybody has a, yeah, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, please feel free to, to do so. Otherwise we'll explain that the, the clarity was that's clear that uh, no question needed. Yeah, any questions, Shay? Malka, yes. A question here. Oh, I see. There are two people. One is Mr. Freeman, and one is Miss Yael. Ladies first. Oh, okay. I'm going to take the uh, the opportunity to ask Dr. Simkovich this question. Uh, so, according to Nehemia, then did they go ahead and actually make their Sukkot? out of Lulavim? Seems to be the case. It's, they, they take, right? So if you look very carefully at Pasuk Tadvav, right? They're bringing So it seems that they're using, what did that look like? It was probably gorgeous. I can't tell you exactly, but it seems that they're, took, they're taking that juxtaposition. Um, you look up Bayikra Chav Gimel and you'll see that's not what it says. It says, you celebrate for seven days in huts, them, right? You celebrate, you're happy, and take these indigenous fruits. It doesn't say why. So that also then is an act of interpretation. That is the that is the interpretation. That is 
Yes, I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. That is the Midrashic play that is happening here, is that they're interpreting Vayikra Chavkim. So at some point, then we go back in time to its original meaning, where oh, we see. have a... <clears throat> they're not a, rewriting, right? So that's what's so fascinating, is they're not rewriting the text, right? You have Vayikra Chavkim, but they're producing um, a tradition that will be known as the oral Torah, right? They're, or, I mean, look, we, we don't do this today, but I'm saying they're producing a tradition of interpretation that runs alongside the written text. And at the same time, the story becomes scriptural. So my point is, is that this is convoluted because there isn't yet a binary between written authoritative text and oral authoritative text. That only happens much later. But what's also, just hold on to this little tidbit. Drash comes before Pshat. And I think that's important because a lot of us are snobby about Midrash. Like, oh, that's just a Midrash. I don't know, the rabbis just made that up. I want the Pshat. Well, you know what, if you want the Pshat, here's a text that prioritizes creative interpretation. Not, you know, not creative like in a loose way, but prioritizes Midrashic reading, so. One more, so then when yeah. does it become that the Lulav then, meaning we don't do that today, right? Don't do that. So it got reinterpreted again? Yeah, so the whole, now you, now I have to tell you obnoxiously to go onto YouTube and watch my second Temple Judaism videos, because yes, you have six centuries before we get to the rabbis and all kinds of things are happening. Not all of that becomes rabbinic law. Yeah, so you have many, many, many centuries and diverse, you know, communities that are all over the world. And these Jews are not practicing what would be understood as normative rabbinic practice. But you know you have you have the core commonalities Shabbat Kashrut Brit Milah, right? Thank you. Yeah. My pleasure. Okay, so now we're going to go to Mr. Friedman. It, it seems to me from reading Ezra and Nehemiah, the temple already existed. I, I think it's <clears throat> described there in a number of places, and I wonder this enigmatic writing about Sukkot not being celebrated has some more, and the joy of celebrating it has more to do with the realization from hearing the text that it was to be a family-based holiday in your home, building a sukkah and not a temple-based holiday. So I, I think that's based on the fact that there was a temple, the fact that the temple was not as successful as maybe some people wanted. And actually, if you look at who was left out at the Watergate affair, <laughs> the high priest is never mentioned. Okay, interesting. Have so a look. I, I've, yeah. So my I said reading, a lot. Okay. No, Thank no, you. you didn't say a lot at all. I my reading is that when they talk about the site of the temple, and I could be wrong about this, that they're referring to the site of the temple, but that it has not been completed yet. I can go back and I can look at scholarship. You think that's wrong. I'm gonna look it up and just to make sure, cause it could very well be that I'm getting that incorrect. But I think either way, there is definitely an emphasis on observing this as families. I don't know that this whole story is about that. It's, I, don't, I wouldn't read it that way as this is about sort of the foregrounding of the home unit, the domestic unit, as opposed to gathering at the temple, uh, because over and over we have an emphasis on the people coming together as one at the site of the temple and as a collective taking on this, uh, you know, almost like renewing the covenant scene. So I think the unity of the people at the site of the temple is hugely central to understanding the story. Uh, that said, I never foist my reading onto anybody else. Um, and there's a lot of ways to read, you know, the primary message of this story. So I appreciate your uh, comment. You can always feel free to send me an email and uh, prove to me that the temple was complete at this time. Again, it's very possible. Um, all right, so uh, it is two o'clock. I want to respect your time. I see some people like Asher Stein are reading very good books. Oh, and uh, if you have insight uh, from that book, please send me an email that I can reference it next week. I'm Simkovich at ctu.edu. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you all have a meaningful uh, Yom Azikaron and a joyous uh, Yom Azmu. Thank you very much. Malka, please go we'll see you next week. Uh, by the way, we said it's only a midrash. That's, of course, the expression Dr. Uh, Rabbi Shulman used. He, uh, part two of his series on unlock, un, unlocking midrash methodology is tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern time.
at 12 p.m. in Chicago. Uh, so that's Rabbi Shulman tomorrow at uh, 1. Of course, before that, at 11 a.m. tomorrow, Marty Lushin can do his series on Parsha Mishpatim, the covenant code sort of uh, after Yitro, before Shavuos for us. And, and tonight, um, we're starting a new series. Dr. Michelle Margolis, Margolis Chesner, who is the Jewish Studies Librarian at Columbia University and the President-Elect of the Association of Jewish Libraries, will be giving a three-part series on the people in of and around the book, how the books tell the story of the Jewish people. So that uh, promises to be a very interesting series. That begins this evening at 8.30 p.m. And then tomorrow night, um, Dr. Sokolo, no, no stranger to Torah Motion, will continue his Wednesday night class and uh, a new series on the philosophy of mitzvot. Also five parts series. We want to talk about Tamei Mitzvah in the lead up to, to Shavuot. Um, Thursday at uh, 1.15, uh, Rabbi Alan Schwartz will be giving a shear on Yecheskel, the dry bones of Yecheskel, modern messages for independence. Of course, Thursday is Yom Atzmaut. As we had mentioned today, Yom Azikaron, and it does behoove us. I mean, it's uh, sort of, we're still on Tuesday, but in Israel, of course, Yom Azikaron has already begun. And uh, of course, you can't have uh, Yom Atzmaut with a Yom Azikaron. And uh, we should, uh, the, the, the terrible sacrifice people had to make so we could have the wonderful, the wonderful state of Israel. Um, but to, uh, so, um, but tomorrow night, uh, Dr. Sokolov will begin. And then Thursday after, after, after Alan Schwartz this year, we'll have our regular year 8.30 on the Parsha. Rabbi, Rabbi Mori Kelman, I do know him a little bit. Uh, we'll be giving this, this year at 8.30 and then my year on the sitter at 9.35 a.m. Note from last week, if I remember, for the next number of weeks because of my teaching schedule, uh, the shears at 9.35 a.m. And Sunday morning, Rabbi Liebtag at 11.15, Tehillim 106. And then on Monday morning, Simi Peters, Migilat Root. So Dr. Simkovitz, if you, if you have a lot of free time and you don't have anything else to do, which I'm sure is not true, we invite you to join one of our many classes or let people in Chicago know about all the wonderful things we do here at Tor Motion. I want to thank you for being a part of it. And uh, everybody should have a wonderful day and we should uh, come together for, for good occasions and uh, a celebration. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.